Welcome to the podcast series Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafta, and today I'll be chatting with Rhett Roberts, co founder and CEO and product officer at Loan Pro. Loan Pro is a SaaS loan servicing software empowering tech forward lenders through automation and data visibility. Hi, Rhett, how are you? Hi, Stacey. Thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, excited to have you on. That was a mouthful of a title. <laughs> yeah, we when you start your own business and innovate over time, you end up wearing a few hats. And so I do oversee our management team, co-founded the business with two of my brothers. The three of us still work together. And my true love is the product side of things. And so I, I oversee our team on the product as well. That's awesome. Do you think you'll ever, ever give up the product side? Um I don't want to. I enjoy it a lot. It's a, <laughs> it, it's really the innovative process of developing and taking an idea and turning it into reality. That's where I, I find a lot of satisfaction. That's awesome. And you're working with your two brothers. How's working with family? It's terrific. We've done business together, a series of businesses over the last 20 years. And so we have different areas that do we divide our responsibilities in and it's worked out real well. I don't really know any other way, but it's worked well for us. I love that. Well, before we dive any deeper, do you want to give the audience a brief overview on your career and essentially what led you to build the business? Sure. So I did my education in investment finance. And as a kid, I was always kind of bit by the entrepreneur bug. We did a whole series of different kinds of businesses um, as you know, in early teens, uh, we would mow tons of lawns and we noticed the shooting range. There was all of the discarded shells. And so as a 14, 15 year old, I built this machine that we would shovel in all the discarded shells and rocks and dirt and it would process those. And we were able to recycle many 55 gallon drum barrels of, of shells for the brass. Um, we had a cattle ranch. We had a whole bunch of things throughout the years. And so uh, I was pretty excited to go study investment finance. And I did so, got an offer back on Wall Street, got married about that time. And uh, wow. when we were reviewing, hey, do we want to move? Do we want to do this lifestyle? And we kind of said, you know, let's give it a whirl. Let's try our own business again. And so I joined my two brothers who I still work with. And we started a car dealership, bought and sold cars for a few years, really enjoyed that. Uh, but we we learned we could make more money if we could help our customers get finance. And so we started what's now known as a related finance company, uh, Some a segment of our customers that couldn't get credit union financing or didn't have cash to buy the cars. We could help them get financing from our company. And we really enjoyed the lending business. Scaled, got a few million dollars out in auto loans and said, hey, this is fun. This is what we really want to do. And we ran into a roadblock in the scaling or the ability to scale our lending business of the software that it was managed on. We went and hunted and really the, the options were you could use software that was from Banking Core and it was hundreds of thousands of dollars and stuck in 1980, right? It's just really yeah. frustrating to use it. And we thought, okay, well, that's not going to work for us. It's crazy expensive. And also it doesn't do what I want it to do. You have to like memorize codes and work with a DOS based system. Mm -hmm. It's like old school to work with. And we thought, well, let's be innovative and a little bit of naive at the time. We thought, okay, let's go ahead and build the platform. But there was also some other issues with the background of finance, uh, the loan origination software that we we're using in the dealerships would oversimplify the world, right? They would ignore irregularity in the first period. And so it, when they would print the amortization schedule, it would treat the first period as one full month when maybe it wasn't. And then when you yeah. would run the software to, to do the amortization, do the math and the loans, that was doing something different than your contract. So that really bothered us. So we, we jumped both feet in and uh, decided to build software for our own lending company. Fast forward a bit, other lenders that we knew in the ecosystem reached out to us and said, hey, we're having these problems. What do you guys do? And we let them know, hey, we have the same issues. We had to build software. And their reply mm -hmm. was essentially, I don't want to build software. Can I use yours? And for the first year and a half, we said no. And we said, no, this is something we built for ourselves. It's a key differentiator as a lender. And yeah. they're fairly persistent. We, uh, we resulted in allowing them to subscribe and use our software and kind of the rest is history. We scaled the business, about 600 customers and growing throughout the U.S. and Canada. 
We provide a lending core, so loan servicing software to lenders uh, ranging from a small mom and pop lender to quite large lenders, especially an in interest in the fintech space. I would not know where to start if I was in your position. Did you have some sort of software development experience? Uh, good question. No, I did not. My education, like I said, is investment finance. Um, strong background in math and like uh, object oriented sequencing and logical sequencing, but no, didn't have any, any development software uh, experience. And so originally, this was just a product that we were building internally. And if you look at many different companies, right, Confluence or MongoDB or Slack or DoubleClick or, mm. you know, everybody, basically, the, the general idea is that as you innovate internally, uh, take Slack, for example, they innovate, they're a, a, a a video game company, right? And they build out and the video game doesn't quite work how the way they want it to, but they've built this really cool way to communicate with their team, go back to the investors and say, hey, the video game side didn't work, but we got this. We think it's something. Should we lean in with it? And we know the story with Slack now. Similar story uh, with some tools, right? Uh, MongoDB, or um, all these different tools that are built within an organization turn into be their own fintechs. That's the same story with us. A tool we built for our own lending company turned into its own fintech of providing infrastructure for lending. So where we started was just a deep understanding of the problem. And I think that's a, a, a unique differentiator. There's many people who uh, come out of school and say, hey, I'm going to start a business and they write their business plan, and they go ahead and, and have a nice solution looking for a problem. And then they have to do product market fit analysis and those kinds of things to see how they can have a good match with their customers. But we came at it from the other perspective, since it was innovation out of a problem we were solving ourselves, we had a very detailed and intimate understanding of the problem. Uh, and then it took just a lot of work and, and, and efforts to do you know, innovation and iteration and yeah. just go through and building that system. How do you take this in-house solution and make it commercial? Can you talk about it from the idea stage all the way to making it a monetized solution? Yeah, it's a great question. So originally the intent was not to monetize it, right? We were going to, it was a, a solution for us internally. And then a little bit of uh, stars aligning and, and things are working out for us on uh, customers that are now customers reaching out in the early days and saying, hey, can I manage my loans with your software as well? And we at, at that time, we were in auto loans. And the first people who reached out to us were actually in business to business, business factoring loans. And so we really thought about it quite a bit and said, OK, well, what's terribly different between factoring and receivable? versus an auto loan or consumer loans or student loans and so forth. And we said, well, most of what's unique about those is the channel on which they are, that they are originated from. But after those loans are funded, about 80% work the same way. And so you fund a deal, push money out the door, and the process that's involved in all of the loan lifecycle events and how you do the calculations and so forth, you can have configuration at the loan level allowing for that um, diversification of different verticals. And so the process that we went through to kind of innovate of taking a company or a tool inside of a company and spinning it off and creating its own fintech company out of it was really just focusing on the problem we were solving, building the infrastructure around that, and then going to market within a kind of a safe incubated uh, environment yeah. where we said, hey, We've got a currently it's an internal tool. Let's test the waters with a handful of customers. Now we had folks reaching out to us saying, hey, I, I want to use that. And so it wasn't terribly difficult for us to get a couple beta testers. Yeah. And in the first year, I think we had 15 customers. And so we kind of moved slow. We've been doing this uh, since you know almost 15 years through the, the different businesses. And so we we bootstrapped the business and built it uh, just kind of block by block. And then earlier this year, we did a Series A. We raised $100 million, but it was kind of backwards from how a lot of organizations do it. We wanted to make yeah. sure we got our product right first. And now we're doing an aggressive go-to-market. 
How did you decide on things like pricing? Like where did you decide or how did you decide, okay, this makes sense to price it at this amount when you were already using the product? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a bit of an evolutionary process as you work across different verticals. And so we're a platform fully uh, hosted in AWS cloud. So we're architected and built for the cloud. So one of your pricing models, of course, you can go check to see what the competitors are doing. Well, mm-hmm. we're uh, we're competing against a variety of things out there, including something running in, in Excel. I, I described the genesis of how we started and why we felt we needed to start building software ourselves, because the competitors out there for a lending core, uh, they typically run them through banking cores, were hundreds of thousands of dollars and yeah. in, inadequate. And so, you know, if your new business is starting, how are you going to swallow the pill of, I need to spend two or $300,000 to get off the ground on software? That's just very difficult for you to do. And so yeah, with definitely. pricing, we came at it from the, the perspective to say, okay, what does it cost for us to provide the software? So uh, the first answer to that is, you can do an analysis based off what your competitors are charging. However, we didn't feel mm-hmm. like we had an apples to apples competitor. It was very expensive, but focused on a different market. And then there's other competitors filling the job like Excel, right? They're, they're just doing something that's not maybe compliant, but they just start, try to run something on their side. So there's the that's the first analysis and price. The second would say a cost plus. What's it costing us since we're hosted in the cloud? We were kind of doing the evaluation of, well, how much does it cost us to provide one loan or a million loans and so forth? Mm. And we we're able to do that evaluation and bring down the cost per unit as it as you scale over time. But that was important for us. What we we landed on is a SaaS based model where there's a membership fee. And then there's what we call billable accounts, basically so many cents per loan per month, and it scales with you over time, really allowing our customers to start small and we grow with them over time. We're viewing it and our customers view us as part of their core infrastructure. So each time we land and work with a new customer, we're really looking at it like a partnership where they don't have to do that really um, painful process of just working with a vendor, but instead we'll start with them. And then as they scale on the number of loans, it scales up incrementally with them. Yeah. You initially declined the opportunity to, to give over the software. What made you one, change your mind and two, realize, okay, wow, I can make a lot of money off of this. Yeah. Great question. So as I mentioned before, the the idea of converting an in-house tool to its own business is an iterative process. And especially where we we didn't come out of school deciding, hey, I want to build loan servicing software or lending core. <laughs> yeah. right? you know, and so it was a, a get an understanding of the problem, solve the problem, find a need, fill a need, right? The old mantra there. But the the process to go through how do you go ahead and say, yes, I actually have something as an internal tool and let me go ahead and build it as a company and, and monetize it. Um, it. It requires a bit of iteration, but it also requires a configuration first model where you say, OK, we're building something and we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to go ahead and hedge our bets by building configuration to say, OK, how can we move fast? And so the idea is as you go with configuration first, and iterations, but you invest heavily in the R&D and also the mantra of fail fast. And so you you take the Mm -hmm. learnings that you make and then you implement them very quickly. And so our agile process of development, we've done a modified agile where we're able to go ahead and build something, try it out, do the R&D. If it doesn't work, we know in a short period of time it doesn't work. And most importantly, why didn't it work? implement those learnings. And so you can move quickly through that process. There is the entire, the the other half of the business, right? The business side of not just the technology about how do you convert a tool into a business, which includes your go-to-market and your strategy out there. And uh, the good news is, is there's playbooks on how to do that side to it. So really the focus from our perspective ought to be on get your product right. Make sure your product meets the needs of your of your customers or potential clients. And then there's there's a playbook on how to do the other half. Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together, 
and uh, created a new hypothetical game. And that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what would you make? Something original and exciting? A Dark Souls city builder? A co-op roguelike? Everything. All of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a, and put it in a first-person shooter. And we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could... Oh, I don't know, it's save a kingdom from some out-of-control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch The Gaming Blender on all your favourite podcast platforms. Love it, love it, love it. We were speaking a couple of weeks ago about your retention rate in the business where we find so often a really high turnover in tech companies. What has Loan Pro done really well to keep their employees happy, how have you built built the right environment? Yeah, that's a top of mind, something we focus on regularly. You're right. In the fintech space, technology in general, but fintech in particular, uh, it's been one of the areas hit reasonably hard by turnover happening in the what they're calling or dubbing the great resignation. But it's also been one, if you go back you have 15 years or so, reasonable turnover in the technology space, you know, under two years when people are churning to another job, basically, as soon as they know what they're doing in their job, they move to a new one, and usually at a different organization. And that's very challenging, not only for the employee to be moving step by step so quickly, but it's also really difficult for the organizations that they're a part of. And so what we built, so our CTO says our brilliant, fantastic friend of mine, uh, he's been with us for approaching 10 years now. And that's a little unusual to have somebody with highly technical skills that have been in around an organization for so long. We feel like we've the recipe that we've built for this is based off of how compensation works. And so we have five principles of compensation. First is, of course, there's money, right? Everybody wants to get paid. It makes the world go round. So we certainly pay competitively. Yeah. And uh, we try to do kind of the carrot model, pay, pay a step above where you think they're at so that they can perform to that level and it incentivize that. And that's what many organizations do. So that's not a key differentiator, but it's certainly important to make sure that you, you land on the money. The second is people. We're really choosy. We figure you spend of your waking hours, you often spend more time with the people you work with than you do your family, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so you want to like the people you work with. You should have fun. You should laugh every day. You should have a good time. Uh, you should generally like what you do. And so we think about this. There's been a lot of talk in, in the economy in general about this concept of work-life balance, and yeah. we, we kind of disagree with the premise of that. We think it should be a work-life integration. You become what you do. If you do your job so that you can enjoy your weekend doing the life you enjoy, you're in the wrong job. You should do something you enjoy doing, and it's work-life integration. So getting the people... Yeah the right fits of, of the folks who see the world that way, who like what they do. That's been really important. Uh, to, just so keep it moving quickly. The, the third is visibility of the full process. Um, I spend a very large portion of my time doing focusing on this point where we, we have a company culture where the best idea wins. And so regardless of the title of the person who has that idea, we want the best this. idea to win, right? And so in order to actually make that work, you have to have informed ideas. So if, yeah. if you are in the business of creating a widget, you need to know what's upstream and downstream for, from you so that you can have an idea and it will be a relevant idea because you might tweak something 5% in the step that you are the specialty in. And that could have big impact for someone up or downstream from you and really help them. And it's no big deal to you, but you don't know what you don't know. And so it's very helpful to have visibility of the full process. If you were to ask my employees and my team members and friends here, what, uh, what's one of the key differentiators, they'll focus on this point. They're not siloed and they're not just creating their widget where it magically shows up to them. They do their thing and then it leaves and does something magic on the other end. They do have visibility of contextual understanding of the why behind what they're doing. And I spend a lot of my time doing this. So we do a lot of, you know, company newsletters, all hands on deck, a lot of written material. And when we hire somebody, I hire a new developer, full stack developer. 
We send them through a two week little loan pro university to understand loans. <laughs> Love it. Understand like, you know, it's not even anything to do with their job yet, right? They're, they're yeah, understanding yeah. all these things because when they're building it, they understand, oh, that's the problem I'm solving. Yeah. So that's a big one. Third, the fourth is intellectually challenged. Um, this means when I hire you, I don't want you to currently know how to do everything we're going to ask you to do. If you do, you're going to be bored very quickly. And so we want you to know how to learn and learn how to how to be able to figure things out. But you should have intellectual stimulation from your job. It should be interesting and challenging and and help you become more. And finally, the fifth one is meaningful work. What we do actually has impact in the real world. We're managing tens of thousands of eye hours, people looking at our screens, our customers, their employees looking at our screens every week. And so when you make a change, it impacts real people in the real world. They could be more efficient. Businesses can save money. They can, uh, their employees can spend time doing other things that are more important to them because we've been able to solve those problems for them. So people get some value out of having real world impact, not just theology. I love this. Something that I've been speaking quite often to different businesses about is this growth period where it gets from maybe around 50 people and then grows to like 100, 150 and the impact that it has on the culture. How have you found this where you talk about, listen, everyone's opinion counts. If you have a great idea, yes, let's go. But what happens when your business is 200 people? How do you manage that? But then also, how do you keep that, that, that company culture alive? Yeah, it's a great question. It's an ongoing challenge. And so, uh, especially when you hire quickly and you scale and grow, you have a disproportionate number of your people who are new or newish. Yeah. And that, that makes it difficult. So what we've gone about is in our induction process, and we do this regularly, we do we call them company stories or history stories, where we go back and we tell stories as to the genesis and origin of our business, the problems we're solving, the funny stories, the crazy things you do when you're operating on a shoestring, all of those kinds of things to help the new people have the same connection with the business of the people who've been here for 10 years. And they they can understand and and, and get the, the, uh, the connection with what you're, the problem you're solving and with the business and, and that relationship there. We also have a very low, we try to keep it no, but very, very low company politicking, meaning you don't need to worry about how you appear to your to the others in the company. Since we want that best idea to win, we're go ahead. And there, there's nothing more endearing than having a employee have an idea, raise their hand and say, this is my idea. And then to have the management team get behind them and say, that's a great idea. Let's allocate the resources and and, uh, materials that need to be dedicated to that to see if it's going to work. And then if that person's idea makes it to your, your printed product and actually what gets published it's no longer my business. It's our business. They have their yeah. DNA in your product. And that's very endearing and, and connecting. And so it, it's an ongoing process to maintain your company culture. It's a induction, but it's not a one-time thing. It's telling those company stories. It's hiring the right people. It's laughing and having fun with what you're doing, not taking yourself too serious. It's uh, it's connecting and having a clear communication about the objectives that you're after. And what you find is that the new people, they they have that newness drop off very quickly and they become, your company culture evolves over time. It's not a matter of keep it exactly the same that it was. It's that you have your guiding principles and your, your mm-hmm. values and you maintain those values, but it evolves as your organizations change. So very early, our, our, when we're 10 people, all of those 10 people had access to the founders. Well, when you get to 100 people, that's logistically not as easy to do to have everybody exactly. have access. So you got to build out the processes to handle that. But you want the new people when you're at 100 or 150, you want them to still feel all of those same company values. I, I love that, Rhett. 
Well, I'm very excited to talk about, and I'm putting my nerd glasses on, and everyone in my business knows this is a topic I love to talk about, is daily routines, strategies to maximize effectiveness and efficiency. I have a (laughs) decently strict schedule. And like what I like to do, I like to wake up early, um, really use my mornings to, to, to myself and whether that's get a workout in the morning or just take a slow start. Um, I also really believe it's really important to look after yourself so that you can be a, the best version of yourself for the business. Mm-hmm. Is there anything specifically you do that you'd like to share? Sure. So I don't know that they're terribly unique to me, but there's been a lot of material written on this topic. I also have my nerd glasses on in that um, I've read a lot of, lot of books about this and, and things have been interesting. You hear about you know some people who do their time slots of five minutes every day, some people that organize their, their cycles. So what's worked really well for me is I'm an early morning person. And uh, that means I typically rise about four to 4.30 in the morning. And my, I've got four kids. My oldest is 12. Um, so my wife and I, typically I'm the only one who's awake when it's four o'clock in the morning and I get a few hours to, to myself and I do the hardest things first. And so I study re- the night before I always have uh, next to my bed, I have a list of all the primary challenges that we're focused on and I resort those in the most challenging first, the stuff I don't know how to do or something that's really challenging to try to figure out. And I review them before I go to sleep. And then when I wake in the morning, I have a couple of hours, typically between 4 and 6 or 4.30 and 6.30, somewhere in that range, that I can focus on those in, in quiet time. Um, also, I for, for sports, I'm a swimmer. I swim a lot. I've done the Escape from Alcatraz race a few times. And I used to be really good at swimming. And now I do it just more for, for exercise. But uh, so I'll, I'll study for a couple hours in the morning to hopefully solve something, have some kind of a breakthrough. And then I've been focused on those problems for quite some time in, in, a, in quiet time. And then I go jump in the pool and go swim a mile. And almost every day, since I have that repetitive process of you know swimming, the breathing, the cadence, a lot of people get this with the running as well. I figure some things out while I'm just thinking on it for an hour or so. And uh, or half an hour to an hour, go swim there. And then I get, you know, do breakfast with the kids and things. And I'm into the office by 8, 830. And then you do normal day. And it seems like during your normal day, you get a million interruptions and you're just meeting with people all day. And so I'd say between 9 and you know 3 p.m. I don't know how terribly productive it is because you're helping to facilitate everybody else moving forward. Yeah. But those first couple hours in the day, I seem to get more done that's on my list than I get through the rest of the day. And then I repeat the end of the day before I go to sleep again, I, I, I sort and order the pro- projects that I'm working on. So I think the most successful for me has been that time that I'm exercising instead of just listening to music or a book or whatever, just letting my mind wander. For me, it works to try to work on the most complex problem that we're, we're focused mm-hmm. on during that time. I was hearing different people's opinions on this and um, just like yours, doing the hardest thing first. Mm-hmm. Um, what I've been speaking to, and for example, my partner, he works the best in the night. Like I do not understand, like after, after 8 p.m., like don't talk to me, you're not going to get a good <laughs> idea out of me. That's just like how it works. But you can wake me up at 3 a.m. and I'll be like, completely awake ready to go and um another theory i heard was just by figuring out what time of the day or night in some people's cases you work the best of course if you're working for somebody else you can't be taking business calls at like 9 p.m 10 p.m but what theory i learned is just figuring out and taking like a week and just jotting down when you feel the most productive and in those hours kind of like you do start the hardest things first is use the hours you feel the best and the most alert to do your hardest tasks or the ones that you feel take a lot of of energy and dedication to. And I was like, that's actually really interesting because I'm a morning person. So I assume everyone else works the best in the morning, but that really isn't the case. Yeah, that's true. And our team, we, we get different personality types that do it different ways. So we're not quite half and half, but there certainly are people who prefer to, you know, they have a hard time getting up in the morning and they, they prefer to stay and work later. And so uh, we, we facilitate that, you know, you, you, you can't have everybody pretend that everybody's the same. And so you need to facilitate a culture and environment 
that allows them the necessary tools and freedom to operate the way that they work. So we do have some of our team that's firing up emails and doing things late afternoon, late evening, and others of us who start very early, which results in, you know, it looks like we're operating 24 (laughs) seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Brett, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm glad we got to nerd out together. Well, Stacey, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Awesome. Where's the best place for listeners to reach you? Sure. Yeah, they can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or also check out our website, loanpro.io. Perfect. Chat soon, Red. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.